in the seventh month of the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shetil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people and say, who, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you know, sorry, how do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in, in, is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst, fear not. For thus says the Lord of the hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of the hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Amen, amen, amen. My name is Pastor Justin, and I am the lead pastor here at New Heights Church. If you are new, and we are glad you're here. Thank you, Dr. Rhonda, so much for the scripture reading this morning. And this is my, I'm gonna be honest, this is my favorite section of Haggai because I think this is one of the most powerful passages in all the Bible, and I cannot wait to dig in. So if you're new here, we are a verse-by-verse -verse church, and what that means is we, we love God's word so much that we preach, it's not gonna work very well. I've had all kinds of computer problems this morning, but we're gonna get through this, amen? We're gonna get through God's word. We love God's word so much, we're committed to doctrine, and that's why we preach God's word verse by verse. And so if you have your Bibles with you, you're gonna wanna open up to Haggai chapter two, and we're looking at verses one through nine. Incredible passage this week because it's gonna teach us how to keep moving forward with God even when we feel stuck or when we feel discouraged or overwhelmed. How many of you have been there before? You can maybe relate to that, I have. And so this passage is so powerful. Because here's the truth, life moves forward whether you do or not. You guys know that, right? Time doesn't stop, things keep happening, you keep facing challenges, opportunities and changes. The question is, Will you move forward with God or will you be left behind? And so that's the question we're gonna answer today. Now before I get into this, I wanna go travel back in time. Uh, the year's 1995 and the Houston Rockets are coming off a season in 1994 where they're the NBA champions. How many of you guys remember a guy by the name of Akeem Olajuwon? Okay, we've got some basketball fans here. Yeah, so, so the Rockets, and they won in 94 because uh, Air Jordan decided to uh, retire for two years. He, he thought it wasn't fair that he won every time, so he wanted to give the league a chance, uh, some other, uh, other players in the league to win. And he, he came back in 96, and then he won another three years in a row. <laughs> and don't let anybody fool you, Michael Jordan's the greatest player of all time. I know LeBron thinks he is, but facts are facts, guys, come on, all right? All right, I, I digress a little bit. So the Houston Rockets come back after winning the NBA championship in 1994. They beat the New York, Knicks, New York Knicks who were favored to win, and they took them in uh, seven games and became the champions. And then this next year, they got off to a horrible start. Midway through the season, they're not even uh, projected to make the playoffs, and everybody's given up, but they didn't give up. Uh, they fight really hard, bring a guy by the name of Clyde Drexler on the team, and they manage to make it to the playoffs, but they're the sixth seed, and so they're not looking good. They're, they're projected to lose the first round. They've gotta face a team, uh, Utah Jazz. You guys know this. They had a powerful duo, Carl Malone and John Stockton. My dad went to school with John Stockton at Gonzaga, so we always kinda of like John Stockton. Uh, but they were favored to win the Rockets one. Then they make it to the second round. Next up, they gotta take on the second seed. 
the uh, Phoenix Suns, led by legendary Charles Barkley. And the Suns had one of the best players in the league, but the Rockets didn't care. The Rockets upset the Phoenix Suns. So now they've upset the Utah Jazz. They've upset the Phoenix Suns. In the third round, they've got to face the number one seed, the, the team that was projected to go on to the NBA Finals, the San Antonio Spurs, because they had a star-studded roster with David Robinson, Dennis Rodman, Sean Elliott. That's a good team. And to top it off, they had a Hall of Famer by the name of Moses Malone. Everybody thought that the Spurs were gonna win, but guess what? They lost to the Houston Rockets again. The Houston Rockets have upset every team they have faced. Now they go into the NBA Finals and they're facing the number one seed in the Eastern Conference, the Orlando Magic, and they happen to have the big guy, Shaquille O'Neal, who's got his sidekick, Penny Hardaway. Nobody thought the Rockets are gonna stand a chance it was projected to go only five games, uh, Orlando Magic. And guess what? <laughs> the Rockets shocked them again. They swept the Orlando Magic to become the NBA champions for the second year in a row. And at the end of that season, the Rockets coach said something. It became a famous quote. In fact, they showed the clip every year when it's the NBA Finals. He said, never underestimate the heart of a champion. And I wanna say this to you today, church, never underestimate the heart of somebody who is fully devoted to God's mission. That should get more amens than Rudy's quote. <laughs> Come on. Never underestimate the heart of somebody who is fully devoted to God's mission. Because here's the thing, yes. Here's the thing, we're looking at a story where the Israelites were called to go rebuild and to rise and to move forward. And what we see in Haggai is a very powerful reminder that God is not just calling us to start something. He's calling us to keep going, to keep building, to keep trusting him through the ups and downs. And I don't know what obstacles that you're facing today in your life, but I know this, God is not done with you. God is not done with you. Man, I'm telling you, the 1995 Rockets, they, they, they faced challenges and they faced obstacle after obstacle. The road looked impossible. People were telling them they are not gonna make it, but they didn't quit, they kept going. I, I don't know what obstacles you're facing today, but God is telling you, don't quit, keep going. Don't quit, keep going. He's calling you to keep going, to keep pressing forward, even when everything and everyone says it's over. Because when God is with you, there's nothing that can stop you. When God is with you, there is nothing that can stop you. And this isn't just, I hope you feel good, take this home, write it down, and, and hopefully you feel good. This is God's word. This is truth in your life. You can take it to the bank. You can count on it. When God is with you, nothing can stop you. So when you get to Haggai chapter two, the people of God's time were facing a season of setbacks. They were looking at ruins completely discouraged, thinking they'd never rebuild what had been lost. And yet God showed up and he didn't let them quit. He said the best is yet to come. Best is yet to come. Listen to me today, Kurt. We might be in a place sometimes in our life where we're looking and saying, I don't think it could get any worse. And God is saying, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. In fact, get to work, be strong, I'm with you. The glory of the future is going to be greater than anything that you've seen in the past. That's what he says to the people of Israel. That's what he says to you and me today. We know the end of the story. We know how this ends. We know that Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again, said he's coming back for his church, said he's going to restore all things. We know how the story ends. Yeah, we're being told, get to work, be strong, God is with us. The glory of the future is going to be greater than anything we've seen in the past. Those are words for us today. Don't look at your life and think it's over. Don't look at your struggles and think it's impossible. God is with you and he has better things ahead. Keep moving forward. Listen to this, you are not defined by your obstacle. You are defined by your heart which is why your heart needs to be devoted to God's mission. So what are we gonna do today, church? Listen, this, this sermon, it's, it's interesting because I'm gonna preach to you and I'm gonna go back and forth preaching to you on a personal level and then preaching to our church at a corporate level. There is a word that God has for New Heights Church right now as a body and I'm sure that God is going to speak to you individually. 
So throughout this sermon, I'm gonna go back and forth, preaching to you personally and preaching to us as a, as a body today, amen? Will you bow your heads with me and pray? Father God, we love you so much. You are a good God, a gracious God, a merciful God, and we are asking that your Holy Spirit would come and do what only your Holy Spirit can do, open up our hearts to receive what you have for us today. Speak through your text. Minister to our hearts today. Encourage us today. Pray and let us apply this truth to our lives and see transformation. Jesus, pray. A. All right. In our text today, the best is yet to come, and we have to. We we see three decisions that we need to make in order to move forward with God. The first decision, if you're taking notes, write this down. Make the decision to own your past. I'm gonna, again, I'm speaking to us corporately and to you individually. So you need to make the decision to own your past and we as a church body need to make the decision to own our past. Look with me at verse one. It says, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people and say, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it, is it not as nothing in your eyes? All right, now, in order to understand what's happening here, I need to take you back to the last two verses of chapter one because you need to understand why chapter two starts out with this exact date. All right, so look with me back. Let's look and see how the end of chapter one concludes. It says, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtel, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, and they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts their God. So Haggai preaches to them. He says, now's the time, no more excuses. They respond, they say, okay, we're gonna get busy. We're gonna do this. And it says when they did this, on the 24th day, of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. So Haggai 1.15 mentions that the people began their work rebuilding the temple on the 24th day of the sixth month. And then Haggai 2.1 states that the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 21st day of the seventh month. So about four weeks later, or around late October. Uh, so there's this gap of about one month between the end of Haggai 1 and the beginning of Haggai 2. And there's a reason I'm telling this, because it, Again, it says that they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. So they heard Haggai. They heard his message. They respond. They get busy and they get working. And then one month into it, they stop again. One month into it, they're discouraged. How many of you guys have ever started something and then you didn't finish? You started off really strong and you, you just didn't finish strong. Like diets. Am I the only one that start? Uh, I'm all excited. I... I'll tell my wife, I'm gonna look like Arnold Schwarzenegger by the end of the year, um, or Sylvester Stallone when he was in his 40s, and then it's like three, we three days into it, I'm back at Skyline, <laughs> and I'm eating again. I, I, when I first came here, one of the first people I met was Ian Mead, who's a, who's a big time runner. The guys ran, uh, I don't know, three or four uh, 100 mile races on the beach. He's a beast. <laughs> That's beast mode right there. And so, you know, I'm in his house and I'm looking, we're talking about running. I tell him I used to run when I was in high school. That's three miles, guys, uh, our cross country rates, you know, comparing to the 100 miles. But he's nice and he's being kind to me. That's, that's great. And I tell him I have a goal of running a marathon. I shouldn't have told Ian because Ian's going to make sure, if I tell him that's my goal, he's, gonna, he's a good friend. He's going to make sure that I run that marathon. And you could ask him. I mean, I start off real strong, I'm going to do it. Week later, how's your running? I'm not running. Actually, I've gained seven pounds because <laughs> Skyline's right down the street from my house and Daylight Donuts is there. And, you know, it's a mess. But I start off real strong. I fe in fact, I remember getting the shorts. I went and bought running shorts, which Liz, my wife, would be like, you can't wear those in public. <laughs> I said, babe, it's what runners wear. I got I to gotta look like the part, you know. And I remember one time we went to the park, we're driving together, I come out in the car, I'm wearing my running shorts. Liz says, you, I told you, I can't go out in public wearing. I said, Liz, no one's gonna see me, I'm running at the park. So I make the run, two miles by the way, and I'm thrown up. So uh, we get in the car, 
I'm training, by the way, right now, and I'm up to 14 miles. I'm going to get it. This year, Ian's keeping me accountable. <laughs> but so we're driving home, and I stop at UDF, and Liz says, Justin, please don't go in UDF. Look like that. What about if somebody sees you? I said, babe, nobody's going to see me. We walk in. I go get the Gatorade. And sure enough, I hear, Pastor Justin. <laughs> and I turn around. There's Susan Ventling. <laughs> I'm like this. Hi, Susan. <laughs> But you start something, you don't finish strong. It's easy to do, right? They, they started, they were excited. One month later, they're fizzling out. They quit, just like that. The excitement fizzles out. They get distracted, they get discouraged. And one month later, the project's dead in the water. That's what's happening here in our text. They, but they don't just quit quietly. No, they, they hit pause, and what do they do? They throw this huge religious festival. Some of you are saying, but Pastor Justin, I don't see that in the text. Where are you getting that? Well, if you go to the book of Ezra, it tells the same story, but it gives us a little more detail. So I want you to look with me at, at Ezra chapter three, and we're gonna look at verse 10 through 13, telling the same story. It says, and when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments came forward with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. And all the people shouted with great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. It's a celebration, right? But, but many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses old men who had seen the first house wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid, though many shouted along for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with great shout, and the sound was heard far away. People did not know if this was a funeral or a celebration. People didn't know if this was a funeral or a celebration. You got the younger generation. They are praising God. They are excited. We've laid the foundation. And then you've got the older generation weeping. And I want you to see something because this is where discouragement set in. And how sad is this? This is the most heartbreaking part of this story. How sad. Do you see where discouragement's coming from? It's not coming from the obstacles. It's not coming from the opposition. It's coming from within. I, I don't want you to miss this. This is important. The very people who should have been the source of encouragement, the priests, the Levites, the leaders, the elders, they are the ones tearing down the faith of the younger generation. They should have been the ones celebrating the rebuilding of the temple, but instead they're weeping and grieving over something they can't get past. Do you see the tragedy here? The younger generation is celebrating. They're finally doing what they promised they would do. They're finally rebuilding the temple of the Lord. And years of captivity after decades of waiting, they're finally getting to work. They're laying the foundation. And the excitement, it's real. People are shouting for joy. It's this great moment, right? But when you, but you, but then you have this stark contrast with the older generation. The, the people who had seen the glory of the first temple, they had seen the glory of Solomon's temple, the one that was covered in gold and marble, a magnificent wonder. And what do they do? They weep. They can't get past their grief to see what God is doing right now. They're too stuck in the past. They're too busy mourning the glory of what used to be to stop and celebrate the work of God that's unfolding before their very eyes. They're crying over a building. They're crying over stone. They're crying over something that doesn't even matter. And they're discouraged. They're crying because they're discouraged. I mean, but what's worse is they're letting their, that discouragement flow out and affect the younger generation who's trying to move forward in faith. 
The ones who should have been the pillars of strength are now becoming the pillars of doubt. They should have been saying, look at what God is doing. Look at what God is doing. We saw the first temple fall, but we're watching the new work of God happen right now. God's hand is on this. His glory is coming. And this is where it gets really ugly. Listen to me. Listen to me, church. When the older generation is grieving, they're not just weeping for the past. They're stopping the younger generation from seeing the future. If you have made your residence in the past, you might just be a barrier for another generation to see the future. Don't allow your inability to move on from the past to blind another generation from seeing the future. The sound of weeping is so loud that they can't even tell if they're celebrating or they're mourning. And you know what happens when that happens? It messes people up. It confuses the younger generation. They can't understand if they should be excited or if they should be sad. They can't even hear the sound of victory because the weeping is drowning it out. And this is tragic, church. I'm telling you, this is a tragedy. You've got a generation that's trying to obey God, trying to rebuild, trying to honor him, and the ones who should be cheering them on are the ones holding them back. Don't miss this. And I wanna get real for a second. Now again, their past was amazing. But sometimes, and I, I, again, I'm gonna go back and forth preaching to you personally and then preaching to us as a church. Sometimes our past isn't grand. Sometimes it's ugly. Sometimes it's ugly. The past can be a brutal place to live, just so you know, even, even the glory days and even the bad days. The past is a brutal place to live. Because you already know that. Maybe it's, maybe it's pain, maybe it's loss, regret, or just straight up disappointment. The past has a way of hanging around your neck like a weight. It has a way of holding you back from moving forward. And that's exactly where the Israelites are at right now. They're looking at the work they're doing, rebuilding the temple, and they're thinking, man, this, this is nothing. What we're building here doesn't compare to the glory that, that was, of what was, you know, the gold, the grandeur of Solomon's temple, it's all gone, we're left with rubble. The past has a way of making you feel like the present is worthless. But here's the thing, you can't live in the past. If you're stuck there, you're never gonna move forward. And this is why God addresses this here. This is why he says this in our text. Who is left among you? Who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is is it not as nothing in your eyes? This is like rubbing salt in the wound. I mean, the first time I read this, I'm thinking, man, God is cruel. How many of you saw the old one? It's way better. How many of you saw that? How many of you are here that remember what it used to look like and you're looking at something that stinks? Hey, God is addressing the issue. God cuts right to the heart. He knows what the problem is. Listen up, God does not, does not want you to ignore your past. This is a lesson here that we can see. He doesn't want you to ignore the past. He wants you to acknowledge it. He wants you to own it. But here's what you need to understand. Owning your past doesn't mean living in it. He doesn't, mean, he, he, he doesn't want your past to control you. What owning your past means is looking at the reality of, of what's happened you know, don't sugarcoat it. There's no denial. And then you gotta make the choice to move forward no matter how hard it is. So let me make it very clear again. If you're writing notes, you can't move forward until you stop letting the past hold you back. If you're stuck replaying yesterday over and over in your mind, you are never gonna walk into tomorrow. So I'm gonna speak to you one-on-one -on -one here. I don't know what your past is, but you can't live it. Let it go, move forward. It's the only way to go. And you know what, New Heights Church, we can't live in the past. We have to embrace the future. If we're gonna live in the past, we can't, em we can't embrace tomorrow. I love what Tori Roberts says. He says the past is a place of reference, not a place of residence. 
So let me ask you something, church. How long have you been living in the past? Maybe you've been holding on to regrets or you've been stuck on what could have been or what should have been, but God is calling you to own it. Own your past, face it, acknowledge it, and then you move forward. Do not let your past define you. You are not your mistakes, you are not your failures, you are a child of God and his grace is more than enough. Do not let your past define who you are. The past is a reference, not a residence. And it doesn't matter if it's an ugly past or an incredible past, you still can't live in the past. You've gotta move forward. Keep living in yesterday's glory, you're gonna miss out on today's potential. What God wants to do now is bigger than what he did before. The older generation in, in this story, they needed to recognize this. The younger generation needed to stop comparing their work to the past and step into the future with faith and courage. Here they are playing the comparison game. Oh, we do that, don't we? I'll do that, I'm gonna be honest, I do that with my, my own family sometimes. Uh, this is why I got off Facebook. I would tell Liz, I don't get it. Like we all, I'd look at friends' lives who graduated with me at Central Bible College and I'd be like, man, they just got it together. They take these really cool pictures right before church. Their kids are all dressed up, they look nice. Dude, if Liam walks out and he's got pants on, it's like a good day. You know, and I'm like, how do they do it? I go to a restaurant with some of my friends from Bible College and their kids are like saying, yes sir, yes ma'am, sitting there. You know, elbows don't even touch the table. They're all proper. My kids are throwing pizza at each other. Liam's eating off the floor. I'm like, where did we go wrong, Liz? Like, what? I don't get it. And so what you do, right, is you go find the kids that act worse than yours. And those are the ones, because you want to pat yourself on the back and be like, we're doing great. So we figured out what families to go eat with. We know, man. We, we want troubled kids. <laughs> You know, my kid may be eating off the floor, but that kid's got the waiter in a, in a headlock. You know, we're doing good. You play the comparison game, right? We do it all the time. And, and here's where they're doing. They're comparing their start to the older generation's finish. Can't do that. And, and if you've been listening to older voices telling you that your efforts don't measure up, whether it's in your church or your ministry or your family, your job, don't let that discourage you. Now, you may not be building Solomon's temple, but if you're rebuilding something for the glory of God, it's worth it. It's worth it. God's grace is bigger than your comparisons. The glory of what's coming is greater than what's been. So to the older generation, don't be the one holding back the younger generation because, because you're stuck in the past. Encourage them, speak life, help them see that God is not done. And to the younger generation, stop comparing your start to someone else's event. Own your moment, trust that God is at work right now. Now I wanna speak to our church for just a minute. We have an incredible, we have an incredible path. But if we choose to have our residence in the past, we will miss out on today and tomorrow. And God is not Done. He wants to do something in this church. So we have to, as a body, move forward and embrace the future for what God has for the church right now. Amen? The younger generation, they were living in the past. And they were comparing their start to the older generation's finish, and that was not a good place to be. That led them to a very dark place and now the work was being stopped and I want you to know something, that's the goal of the enemy and unfortunately, without probably realizing what they were doing, the older generation stopped the work of the Lord. And now you've got the older generation and the younger generation and they're at a complete stop. They just stopped doing the work of the Lord four weeks and they were all excited four weeks ago and now they're discouraged and nothing's being done and the enemy thought he won what the enemy wants to do. We serve, we, we serve a God who is a powerful God, who has redeemed us from death and sin, and there's an enemy who's very real, not what you see in cartoons depicted as a cute little uh, horned devil. No, it's an enemy that wants you dead. He wants to take out your family. He wants your kids. He wants everybody in hell with him because he's not happy. That's, that's, 
The, the Bible describes him as a roaring lion. He's literally, you watch National Geographic. It's not, hello, kitty, come here, kitty. No, he's a nasty predator. He's out to kill, and he has stopped the work here. So the first thing you need to do is make the decision to own your past. Second decision, if you're taking notes, you need to decide to work with God right now. Right now. Look with me at verse four through five. It says, yet now be strong. Be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong. O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, be strong. All you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. What do you do when you're discouraged? Well, God says two things here, and I think it lines up with the New Testament. Two things, be strong, do the work. Be strong, be strong, be strong. Man, he's repeating it. You think if he's repeated it three times, it's pretty important? What does he tell you to do? Be strong, be strong, do the work, I'm with you. Be strong, do the work. I'm gonna get really repetitive today. I'm gonna say it again. Maybe somebody's not understanding. If you feel like you're in, at the end of your rope and you feel like you just cannot take another step and you're asking yourself, what do I do? And I think there could be people in our church today who are at this place. I don't know whether it's problems in the family. I don't know if it's problems with the job. I don't know what it is, but you just feel like you cannot do anything more. You are tired, you are exhausted, and here the Lord is telling you, do the work and be strong. This is, this is for you. What do you do when you're discouraged? Be strong, do the work. Be strong and do the work, even if you're, you're exhausted, even if you're tempted to quit, even if you feel like the progress is slow and you're not making any difference. God is telling you, be strong and do the work. Be strong and do the work. Craig Groeschel, who probably was inspired by E.M. Gray, quoted, said this, successful people do consistently what normal people do occasionally. I'm gonna say that again. Successful people do consistently what normal people do occasionally. Now, let me, let me get real personal with you in my own life. I've told you before, I've always been honest, that I've battled discouragement and sometimes I'll battle anxiety. And man, if you've ever battled anxiety, you can go from being on top of the mountain to being in the valley, just like that. I could always relate to Elijah. I love the story of Elijah, because man, he just had a showdown with Baal on the mountaintop, and God came down and did this miraculous work, and, and then he goes from that to, and he's so depressed, he's suicidal. He wants to end his life. And, and I, I could relate in the sense of, man, I, it, that's what anxiety will do to you. It'll just cripple you, and, I, and I'll struggle with it. And I've had a mentor in my own life over the, the course of the last maybe, maybe two years pretty much telling me, Justin, if you want to be successful spiritually in your life, you've got to do what most people don't want to do. You just got to be strong, and you got to do the work. You got to be consistent. You gotta wake up every day and keep fighting the fight. You gotta wake up every day, even when you got thoughts going through your mind, and you need to take those thoughts captive and make them obedient to Jesus Christ. And this is where most people get tripped up because they don't wanna do the hard work. They don't wanna be consistent in the hard work. They just want quick and fast results. And I love this quote, successful people do consistently what normal people do occasionally. You can apply that to anything in your life, whether it's your job, whatever it is. You're not just gonna be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. It's not like you graduate from college and they're like, here you go. You've gotta do consistently what normal people do occasionally. You've gotta be consistent in your own spiritual life to do the work. Here's the great news, church. You don't have to be strong in your own strength. And we're living in the new covenant now. Some of you say, well, what does that mean? That means when you're weak, God's strength is perfected in you. It means when you hit the wall, 
you don't feel like you can go any further, keep going, that's when God does his greatest work. You don't have to be strong in your own power. The Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, is inside of you if you have surrendered your life to him. If you're a believer, the power of God is in you. And not just, that's, it's not just some really nice theological thought to encourage you for today and then tomorrow you face hardship and you're, no, this, this, is, this is an amazing truth. The supernatural power for living the Christian life is in you. Holy Spirit is in you. So when you feel like you can't make it another day, when you're ready to quit and you don't know if you can take another step, guess what? You're in the perfect spot for God to show up. Isn't that, isn't that something when you think about that? I remember in college, my senior year, 2005, Central Bible College, my dad was battling a brain tumor and I was so discouraged. And I went to Bible college thinking I was like Michael Jordan of ministry. You're like, man, I, when you're young and God calls you, you're like, God, you call the right person, boy, I'm gonna, I'll do such great things. And you go to Bible college and you're like, wow, I am not good. <laughs> like, you're looking at all this amazing talent. That guy preaches incredible. That guy doesn't have a stutter. That guy's getting A's in all of his theology classes. That guy, it, you just, you, all of a sudden you realize where you kind of stand. And I remember being at my lowest point my dad's dying of a brain tumor and I just don't feel like I have anything left to give. And I went into a professor by the name of a doctor, or Professor York, sat in his office and I told him, I don't have anything left to give. Nothing. I have no energy to muster up. I can't do this and I'll never forget his response. Justin, you're in the right place for God to go. You're in the perfect spot for God to show up because God doesn't want you to do it on your own. He wants to show you what his power can do through, through you, when you've got nothing left. So you're discouraged, so what do you do? You be strong in the Lord and you do the work. You wanna give up, but God says be strong and do the work. I want you to see something here. The act of doing is pretty important. So it's not just a matter of having it right here. You've gotta do the work because the text, notice what God said. He doesn't say to him, hey, why don't you go and have a, a, a pep rally? I want you to go pump up the people. I want you to dream about uh, big things. I want you to strategize. Right now, here's what God says, do the work. Be strong and do the work. The act of doing is important here. Do the work, show up to do the work. Show up to do the work. Church, I can't tell you how many times as a pastor I've had people say, uh, hey, pastor, I think our church needs to do this. This is a ministry, we're not doing it, and just so you know, that's what God does. Even in our text, he stirs up the spirits of, the spirit of the people. He'll stir your spirit to do something, and so you come in, you tell the pastor, hey, Pastor Justin, I'm I think we need this. This is, a, this is lacking in our church, and, and I love it when the spirit does that, because I can't do it all, my staff can't do it all, but God wants to raise up some of you to do it. And so then I'll say, well, I think God is stirring your heart so you can start and lead this. And then I'll hear this, oh, no, 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 I can't do it. I can't do it, sure you can't. Show up, show up, do the work. Show up and do the work. You can do it. The spirit inside of you is what's gonna empower you to do it. It's not you, God wants to do it through you. And he wants to show you his power and his strength and his might, amen? So if God is stirring your spirit to do something, I'm telling you, all you gotta do is show up and do the work. He's strong. I mean, it, it's easy to get to the point where you're like, I don't even get it. Or I've been teaching this class and, or, or, or I've, been, I've been teaching youth for 30 years and I, I don't think I'm getting anywhere. I've shared this story before, but I was so discouraged right out of Bible college, my first job upstate New York and in Alcove, New York, and I, we're busing in kids from the projects, and it was so bad, police officers had to come. So we started, it, it, so many fights and knives would be pulled. It, 
And for a little AG kid from Spokane, Washington, this was just something I wasn't used to. Um, and I, I remember just thinking, I, I'm preaching, I'm trying to preach. At first, I tried to do 30 minutes, verse by verse, with these kids. <laughs> it, fights would break out. Kids would be choking each other out by the end of the night. So, so then it's 10 minutes. We're going through verse by verse with these kids. And I remember just feeling like nothing is working. These kids don't even hear me. Nobody's even listening to me. I'm wasting my time. But God gave me a nugget. He really did. And, and I didn't see anything when I was there. I saw no life's changed the whole time that I was in New York. I never saw one of the kids give their lives to Jesus, come up to the altar, never saw anybody baptized in the Holy Spirit. It just felt like I was wasting my time. But years later, I got called by a prison chaplain. He said, are you, are you Justin Hansen, the one who pastored at one point in Alcove, New York, Freedom Chapel? I said, I am. Am I in trouble? And he said, no, but do you remember uh, somebody, and I won't say his name publicly, but do you remember so-and-so? And I said, yes, yeah, yeah. And he said, I just wanted you to know from one minister to another, I thought you should realize this and know this. That person was arrested. He was facing a sentence. He was in a prison cell wanting to end his life because uh, he had got himself in big trouble. And he remembered back to when he was a 14-year-old kid something a pastor said in one of the churches and he asked for a Bible, and I was able to lead him to Jesus. But I just thought, from one minister to another, you sh I, I thought you would want to know that you planted the seed, and that seed's coming to fruition here in prison. He's studying global to become a minister with the Assemblies of God, and he leads Bible studies in the prison. And I, I just, I'll never forget that, because I just, I felt like I wasn't doing anything, but guess what I did every Wednesday night? Showed up, did the work. So God might be stirring some of you to do something. What do you do when you're discouraged? You be strong, you do the work. And you know what? One day, you're gonna look back and you're gonna realize the foundation was built. Do the work, don't stop, because God's doing something. You can't see it yet, he's, he's gonna do something through your faithfulness. I promise you, we gotta show up and do the work. Be strong, do the work. So we make, we make the decision to own our past, we make the decision to, to work with God. And lastly, we need to make the decision to dream big. Now it's time to dream big. Once we're already doing the work, then we're able to dream big. And my computer just died on me, so we're gonna preach the, the end of this service with, it's all right, I could do this. Enos is gonna break up. Look at that, you got my notes. Be strong, do the work. Good, I like it. Hey, this is why the old notebooks are really good. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Dream big for what's next. You're writing notes, write that down. We come to the final step. The people are looking at their small beginnings and they're thinking this is nothing compared to what was, but God says to them something. The future will be greater than the past. I want you to see this. If I both. Yep. All right. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet, one, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, this is, this is powerful. Enos, I lost him. Just went to, this is powerful because here's what God is saying. I'm gonna do something greater. And here's what's crazy about this story is they never got to see what, what God was talking about here. They didn't get, we know it because we know the end of the story. We know that when Jesus died on the cross, he literally changed everything. And, and, and it's really important for you and me to see that because, because what he did was he said, uh, at one point you had to come to the temple to experience the glory of God. You had to come to the temple and now what's happened because I've sent my son Jesus to die on a cross, to die a death you should have died, and then to take on the, the punishment that you should have received, and then he rose again to offer you redemption, 
and now I'm gonna change everything because you don't have to come to a temple anymore. You don't have to come to a place with brick and mortar. The, the temple is gonna come and live inside. You're gonna be the temple, and the power and the presence of God is gonna dwell inside of you. Inside of you. It changes everything. It's a game changer. It's a game changer. It's incredible. That's what he's saying. But we know the end of the story, but they didn't. They had to just trust God. You know, God is telling us over and over, he knows how the story ends. He's directing us each step. He's guiding us each step. And he's got a plan for his, his greater purpose, his greater glory. And sometimes you and I, are, we're, we're just taking every step and we're not, we're not really knowing what the future holds, but we have to just trust God that he has a plan. You ever been there? And here he's saying, you gotta dream big. He's telling them, look, what, I know the old temple and I know what I'm about to do and it's greater. It's greater and the most amazing thing is you and I are a part of that plan. You and I are a part of that plan. We're the greater. Because when we give our lives to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of us. We go out with that, with that same power, same boldness. And this is why we say here at this church, the greatest ministry doesn't take place here on Sunday morning. I refuse to build a church that views ministry like that. I refuse to do it because we don't understand what God was trying to do. We say the greatest ministry takes place outside of these doors and it takes place during the week because it takes place through you. You are the church, not this building, not brick and mortar. You are the church and God wants to do something through you. And when the church understands that, that's when you see growth because they're not dependent on, but you gotta come to this religious service for, for, to receive something. Now you guys are going out as ambassadors of Jesus Christ and God wants to use you to bring life to those who need it. He wants to use you to introduce grace and mercy to your neighbors, to your friends and family who don't know Jesus. You guys are plan A. You guys are the church and the glory of God dwells inside of you. That's amazing. That's something that just, it blows your mind. It should blow your mind. You know, this is so, he's so, love this guy. So let me tell you something. Every time that you take a step of faith, every time that you put a stone down for Jesus, he's being glorified. When you serve others in his name, you're bringing him glory. When you love someone like he's loved you, you're glorifying him. When you forgive someone who doesn't deserve it, he's being glorified. When you speak his name, when you lift him up, when you carry his message, you're glorifying the king. So why on earth would we be discouraged? Why would we give up? It always comes back to this. We're discouraged when we forget that we're not doing this alone. We're not like the people in the Old Testament who had to go to the temple and hope that maybe, just maybe, they could encounter God. No, we don't have to go to the temple. The temple came to us. God, in his grace, came to us in the person of Jesus, and he gave his son so we could be made right with him. And now, because of Jesus, his spirit is living inside of us. And I know I've been repetitive today. I want you to get it. It's, this, is the, this is the most powerful part of all of this book. Here it is, the big idea, the big picture. You're not doing this in your own strength. You're doing it in his strength. And he's promised that he will never leave nor forsake you. So what do you do when you're discouraged? You be strong, you do the work, you don't throw in the towel, you don't back down, you keep moving forward, you keep building, you keep doing the work because God is with you. And he's faithful to finish the work that he started. The Bible says he who has began a good work in you will be faithful to carry it out to completion. You're not doing it for nothing. There is a harvest coming. Don't grow weary in doing good. Don't give up. The harvest is coming and in the right time, in God's time. But it's only for those who. So let me say it again. Be strong. Don't let anything stop because he's with you. If you're in Jesus Christ, the glory of God is in you and that's the power that you're working. Jesus is the greater glory and because of him, you're gonna finish the race. You're gonna reap the harvest. So don't quit, don't stop, keep going. And the worship team can come back up today. We're gonna finish. But I, 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 wanna, I wanna challenge you, and I'm gonna probably challenge you 
more than I ever have in the last four years. Today I'm talking about a reality of God's presence and God's power. And oftentimes our churches forget that and we operate without God's presence and without his power. And when we do that, it's really, it becomes just uh, tradition or it becomes religion. And we miss out on his power and his presence. And I think this passage is so powerful because it's this invitation to align our hearts and our life with his mission and his purposes. And then it's this invitation to experience his power in his presence. Jesus, the son of God, the savior of this world is not just a distant figure that you pray to once a week. He's in you, he's inside of you, he's living in you. And if it doesn't change everything about the way you live, then, then something is wrong. And maybe you're here today and you feel like you're carrying the weight of the world. You've been living your life completely on your own strength. You're trying to do all of it by yourself and it's crushing you. And you are discouraged, you are defeated and you are tired of trying. And you're wondering, where is God? Where is God? And I want you to know this today, God is with you. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and you have surrendered your life to him, he is with you. He's with you. And if, if you're honest with yourself, some of you have been running from God. You've been ignoring his call. You're trying to do it on your own. Maybe you've never fully surrendered your life to Jesus today. So you've never experienced his presence or his power in your life. And today I'm gonna to tell you, stop running, come home. Stop running and come home. Jesus gave his life for you so that you could be free, so that you could be forgiven, so that you could have his power at work inside of you. And if that's you today, if you're ready to stop pretending, if you're ready to stop fighting, you're ready to stop going at it alone, I wanna give you an invitation. And this isn't just an invitation for salvation, it might be. Some of you, maybe you need to come and surrender your life to Jesus today. And that could even be a church person who's grown up their entire life in church, but you've never really surrendered your life to God. Or maybe it's just somebody who's tired, tired and exhausted, you're tired of feeling like you're alone, and today you're ready to say, God, I wanna give it back to you. My life is yours. I'm, I'm desperate for your power and your presence in my life. Man, can I just be honest with you? It's not a sign of weakness to acknowledge that. I need that today. I'm going to respond to my own altar call today. I'm gonna step, I'm gonna take the pastor hat off today and I'm probably not gonna pray for anyone today because I'm gonna be right here asking for God's power and presence in my own life because I'm tired of trying to do it alone. It's not a sign of weakness. And so I wanna encourage you, I wanna challenge you today. As the worship team comes, they've got two songs for us. I'm challenging you. If that's you and you need God's power and presence in your life, then you need to get up out of your chair and you need to come forward. I've got a prayer team that's gonna come. They can pray with you. And if you don't wanna be prayed for, no problem. They're here if you want it. If not, I'm still challenging you to come up. Get up out of your seat and respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing right now so that you can experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you're tired of doing it alone, if you're tired of operating in your own strength, if you need a breakthrough from the Holy Spirit in your life, I'm telling you right now, get out of your chair and come forward. Come forward. Father, we invite you right now to send your Holy Spirit amongst us right now in this place. We want to desperately encounter your presence in our life and your power in our life. God, some of us are exhausted, we're tired, and we need, we need that perspective once again, and we need to experience your presence in our life. We need to be encouraged. We need our hearts encouraged. We need our hearts strengthened. Life is hard, whether it's our family, our job, our finances, our marriage, whatever it is. We need you in our life. And so, God, I'm inviting everybody here right now who, who's at that place where they want your power and your presence to come forward because I know 
I know they're gonna encounter you today. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus Christ, your son's name, amen.